This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So um, <clears throat> our final speaker, uh, Dr. Nora Turot, uh, just turn off the, um, the laptop, uh, needs very little introduction. Uh, Nora is uh, really an internationally renowned uh, hepatologist. Uh, she's a great mentor. And um, for uh, our fellows and young faculty, uh, she's the director of the Viral Hepatitis Center and uh, had also been in charge of the clinical research network for fatty liver disease. And I like your title, actually. Uh, what, the, what are the challenges and uh, the solutions for hepatitis C? Thank you, Nora, for doing this. You know, I have to say, I, I'm coming up here and I'm starting to feel a little sad thinking that, you know, there's going to be a, a time in the not too distant future where there won't be a hep C talk. <laughs> And I, I, I sort of feel like every year it might be the year. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, I'm also, I brought my phone up so I could try to keep on time as well, um, especially since, you know, as always, I'm the one that's standing between you and that glass of wine. So, I'll do my best here. Um, I think everybody's very, getting very comfortable with the HCV therapeutics now. So, what I wanted to do today was really to sort of look at kind of a, a few areas where, I think we still have some challenges. So shown here is really our current therapies. We have an all oral therapy for every genotype now. Um, and we have options as shown here. This is the genotype one in particular. We have four different all oral therapies. Genotype two, we just have one at the moment that's approved, the Savosphere and Ribavirin. Genotype three, we now have two options. Um, and there's ones for four, uh, fives, and sixes. So really we have all oral therapy for our patients. And we have all oral therapy that's really well tolerated and highly effective. I'm not going to go through all of the results that already exist. What I thought I'd talk about today is a few of the difficult to treat populations, um, a little bit about where I see kind of complexity of therapy still being a major issue, and kind of the new arena I think where we could spend a little bit of time is in treatment failures. At the top of my list is the access to treatment. I'm not going to talk about that, but to say it's still an issue. Um, there are patients that really want to be treated that can't be treated yet, and I think we as providers still need to work on how to make treatment as available to as many patients as possible. It's getting better, uh, but I think that still remains kind of the, the top priority. Um, in the difficult to treat populations, there, the number that are difficult to treat is diminishing. So in the past, in the era of peg interferon and ribavirin, the list was fairly long. This is kind of a short version. The genotype 1, African-Americans, treatment experience, cirrhotic, HIV positive, transplanted, and decompensated cirrhotics. Um, the current uh, DAA era, um, I, we now have replaced genotype 1 with genotype 3 as the most difficult to treat, um, but getting better. But it is the one I think remains one of our challenges. Um, renal patients, we have really few therapeutic options. Decompensated cirrhotics, especially those with child C cirrhosis, I think still uh, we have some places where we need improvement. And the new group that's emerged really is what to do with the patients who fail an all oral therapy. So let's start with genotype 3. Um, shown on the left is the results from the Ally 3 study. This is really what led to its approval for treatment of genotype 3. So an all oral therapy, ribavirin free. In patients that are non cirrhotic, we have a success rate of 96%. It's fantastic. Well tolerated and a ribavirin free element. But as you can see, the uh, cirrhotic patients did quite poorly with a success rate of only 63%. Um, and so there's been subsequent studies that have been done, and I'm presenting a little bit ahead of the, the actual meeting. This is data that's going to be presented at the ASLD. I'm not giving you anything that's not in the abstract, but um, they, there's an Ally 3 plus study which uh, looked at cirrhotics only. So what they did in this study was, if you want to improve the performance of a DAA, 
Uh, we usually are using two strategies currently. One is you add ribavirin, and the second is you treat for longer. And they did both of those things in Ally 3 Plus. It's a relatively modest number of study, uh, patients studied, as you can see. Uh, but it does work in the sense that we can improve our success in the cirrhotic patients by adding ribavirin for 12 weeks up to 83. And if we add ribavirin and treat to 16 weeks, we can get up to 94%. Now, this is small numbers, and I think we need to see this confirmed in larger numbers of patients. But this does appear that it may be um, the solution. Uh, that clearly, ribavirin may be, um, even though we want to walk away from ribavirin, still might be something to add back in the cirrhotics here. And treating even for an additional four weeks can improve our SVR rate. Now, um, of course, uh, genotype 3 decompensated patients um, remain also kind of, I'm going to say that cirrhotics are a challenge, and then when you move to decompensated cirrhotics in general, they always have response rates that are a little um, less, um, that are a little less than those with cirrhosis. Um, so here I'm showing you data from, again, um, the Foster study is, was presented at EASL, and then there's two new studies that are going to be presented at the ASLD meeting that's coming up. And again, to make the point that even in this kind of very difficult group to treat, the genotype 3 decompensated patients, that if we, again, add ribavirin uh, to the mix or extend treatment, that we can generally, even in this group of patients, see success rates that are in the 80 to 90 percent range. So I think that if you're treating patients with cirrhosis um, currently, um, the right strategy is to add ribavirin. And if you cannot add ribavirin, then you should treat for longer. But I actually think the ribavirin is going to be your most cost-effective strategy. Now, there was also another study that, was, um, that has been um, published, actually, that also brought interferon back into the mix for the cirrhotic patients. This is the Busan study. And I pointed out just as the other alternative. So in this study, um, what they did is they randomized treatment-naive and treatment-experienced patients to receiving either Savosphere or ribavirin, which is our original therapy for genotype 3 for 24 weeks, versus using soft PEG and ribavirin for 12. That's the purple bars. And you can see that in every group, but particularly in the patients that were cirrhotic, that if you want to enhance your response rates in that group of patients, adding PEG interferon was another option. So if you have a patient that's PEG interferon eligible and you think and you can treat them with that combo, then you can see that your success in the cirrhotic patient population is in the 90 to 95 percent range when you, uh, sorry, 90 to 95, uh, uh, 90 percent plus range in the cirrhotic patients. I'll also point out that in treatment experienced patients that are non-cirrhotic, that this is also a very good strategy. As you can see here, if we look at the middle set of bars there, from 82% up to 94% when we um, are using this 12-week uh, therapy. So another option to consider. It's a tough sell, I would say, with patients these days to um, introduce interferon back into the mix. Most of them are all into oral therapies, and I think most providers are as well. But I, I bring this study to your attention. It is in the guidelines now as, as one of the things to consider in this group of patients. So where are we with genotype 3? I, I did say this is the more difficult to treat group, and I think that's still true, but probably about to change. Certainly, if you have a cirrhotic patient, the cladosphere and savosphere for 12 weeks is an excellent option. But when you move to the cirrhotic population, that's a group in which you either have to you know, add ribavirin or think about using PEG interferon. Um, you may also choose to await some new therapies. We're going to see more new data, triple therapy coming out, um, and so you may choose to await those therapies, although that's not usually what we do in cirrhotics. And then for decompensated cirrhotic patients, I do think you need to add ribavirin, um, and you have to consider treating for 24 weeks. That is actually in the guidance document as well. But I think this is actually a group of patients in which we are increasingly asking ourselves when we're seeing them in the clinic whether we should just defer their treatment until after transplantation, where with a new liver, we'll have many more treatment, uh, a much more likelihood that we'll be successful in uh, treating their HCV disease. So that's genotype three. Renal impairment. So um, as you know, we actually have very few approved therapies for patients who have GFRs that are under 30. And the reason for that is the Savosbuvir, which is kind of a backbone for many of our combination therapies is not approved for use in patients who have creatinine clearances under 30. So you see here I have the drugs across the top, and really when you get down to the under 30 uh, mils per minute, um, really have very few options. And indeed, in the guidance document, they're basically saying don't treat. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but they say if you have a patient who's non-serotic and you urgently need to treat them, that might be a patient who has cryoglobinemia and rapidly progressive renal dysfunction, um, that your option um, in terms of what's the recommended therapy is to use ombidesvir, paritopavir, plus disobivir. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data that supports that recommendation. But this is a group in which really we have some challenges because, for example, we don't have a therapy if a patient happens to have renal failure and is decompensated because PIs are out of the question, so nothing to offer that patient. Um, and um, in not all patients can tolerate PIs, and there are some drug-drug interactions, so some challenges, I think, in using uh, uh, DAA therapy in patients with renal impairment. Uh, so let me show you a little of the data. So this is really just, again, mapping, marking you through the, the drug options. Um, Decladosphere is actually a drug you can consider using in patients with renal failure, but it's difficult to think how you're going to combine it with another drug, but you could conceive of that. Um, and then, as mentioned, the real options for us are the paritopavir, ombidesvir, desobuvir. So this is just the data that says that the sevosphere and ribavirin in patients with severe renal impairment leads not to an increase in the sevosphere levels, but actually it's metabolite. Um, and in fact, you see a four, fourfold higher level of the GS331007 exposures, and it's that concern that has actually led to the recommendation not to use it in patients with creatinine clearances under 30. There are some data that look at sevosphere 200 milligrams daily plus uh, ribavirin and showed that it was safe and relatively well tolerated, and there have been a few case reports, case series reported in patients using that dosing, uh, claiming, uh, showing that it is safe um, and with some um, uh, a good efficacy, but it's case series. The largest, oh, my, my box has moved. Um, the largest safety outcomes are from the HCV target, and this is data that um, uh, Bruin Saxena, who uh, is one of our senior uh, transplant hepatology fellows, uh, put together and presented at EASL this year. But basically, it's a little hard for you to see, but I'm going to just tell you that basically it showed that even though it's not recommended that we use sevosphere based therapy in patients with GFRs under 30, it happens, although not in large numbers. In this large, large database, 17 patients actually met that criteria. They were largely patients that had, um, you know, transplants, some decompensation, so had reasons why they had abnormal renal function. And what the analysis uh, showed is that the SVR rates were the same, so no, no compromising the SVR rates, but that there were higher rates of worsening renal failure, uh, sorry, renal function, uh, more renal adverse events in the patients that had GFRs under 30. Now, that doesn't mean it's causative, that the sevosphere caused this. It may just be a reflection of the patients who were receiving this treatment. But it was sort of a cause for pause in terms of um, how we use uh, sevosphere in this group of patients. So uh, clearly, we'd like to move to a drug combination in which we know there is no um, impact um, in terms of the renal dysfunction. So indeed, um, this combination is the one group of drugs in which there's no um, no contraindication to using it in patients with end-stage renal disease. So this would be a, a good choice if you do need to treat a patient who's got end-stage renal disease. And this study, which is the RUBY study presented at the EASL last year and is going to have follow-up um, this year at the ASLD meeting, uh, showed us, as shown here, the patients, there's 20 patients treated, genotypes 1A and 1B. Those with 1B were treated without ribavirin. Those without, with genotype 1A were treated with ribavirin. All the patients became undetectable on treatment, and um, there's one patient who didn't quite get there yet. And in this initial analysis, they had a limited number of patients who'd made it to SVR4, but, um, and a very few had made it to SVR12. Now, updated data are going to be presented at the ASLD. In the abstract that's been submitted, they report an SVR rate of 100% in the 13 patients that had made it to post-treatment week four and an SVR of 100% in the six that had made it to SVR 12. So we'll see the final results of this study at the upcoming ASLD meeting. But the most important thing that I took away from the study when it was presented at the EASL meeting is that it's safe, that it was a drug combo that we could use. So this is an option for you to consider in your patients with end-stage renal disease. Um, but as was um, really highlighted by the guidance document, um, they did not recommend that it be used in patients with more advanced liver disease, cirrhotics um, were, certainly should be used with caution, and it should not be used in patients who have decompensated liver disease. 
Um, clearly, this is an arena in which we're looking for new therapies, and I think most of us are, are kind of holding our breath for the approval of the next combination of grisoprovir and albosphere. This is expected to be approved early in 2016. This is a combo, a, a one pill a day, that has been studied extensively um, in patients with uh, advanced liver, uh, kidney disease. So here's 12 weeks treatment with this combination. Um, a lot of these patients were also on hemodialysis. It's a fairly large data set, 116 patients um, that had a full data set, um, 122 that were actually treated. It's ribavirin-free, I'll point that out as well, and you can see the success in terms of achieving SVR with this combination is excellent. So I think for many of our patients that have um, uh, renal failure, um, most of us, I think, are awaiting the approval of this combination, which seems like it would be an excellent choice for our patients. But if you do need to treat now, we do have a combination available. That's the ombidesvir, pyrotopavir, ritonavir, and dasabavir combo. So um, lots of things to consider if you need to treat a patient with renal failure. I just kind of highlight them here. Um, you really have one treatment of, of option now, and hopefully very soon you'll have a second one available to you. But again, to make the point, sevosphere-based therapy is not recommended in patients who have uh, the GFRs under 30. Now, oh, that's interesting. There we go. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about advanced cirrhosis. You would think that at a transplant meeting I'd spend most of my time here. <laughs> but um, there's a, I could spend like a lot of time talking about advanced cirrhosis and especially the whole question of who to treat and who not to treat. But I'm going to just make a few specific comments. Um, one is that the decompensated patients do have slightly lower SVR rates, but I would say you know, most of them can be treated and um, certainly there's a lot of reasons to consider treating decompensated patients. In general, this is a group of patients in which you should always be thinking about how to add ribavirin and consider extending therapy if you cannot. And uh, there are now emerging predictors of the things, uh, of the patients that are likely to get sort of reversal of their decompensation. I think the, the emerging data suggests younger patients, those who have more preserved liver synthetic function, and perhaps those with less severe portal hypertensive complications are the group most likely to see reversal in their um, decompensation and may be the group that's uh, best suited in terms of treatment with the goal of getting them off the transplant list. But um, I will say at the ASLD meeting, there, there's not enough data in the abstracts for me to present it to you today, but I'm gonna just, if I go back to that idea of, of you know, taking people off the list, there does seem to be some emerging um, consensus around MEL score and which MEL score might be the cutoff for expecting improvement versus not. At least two abstracts that I read um, suggested a meld of 20 might be the number. Um, so look for those at the upcoming ASLD meeting. Hopefully we'll have more details. These are two studies. Um, I have lipidiposphere sevosphere um, on the left and decladosphere sevosphere on the right. Um, the reason I'm showing you these studies is that these are the only drugs that are approved for treatment of decompensated cirrhotics. So only patients with decomps can get sovosphere with an NS5A inhibitor. Protease inhibitors are not recommended for patients with decompensated disease. So these are your treatment choices. And my point in showing you these slides is really to say, again, that when you have a child's QC patient, they tend to have uh, diminished rates of SVR compared to patients that have child's A or child's B cirrhosis. That may not preclude you from treating, but I do want you to be thoughtful about initiating treatment in patients who have decompensated cirrhosis because, as we're going to talk about very shortly, when patients fail treatment with this combo, um, you can be certain that they're going to have NS5A resistance. And that NS5A resistance may limit your treatment options for them down the road, for example, post-transplant. Um, there's now more data, this is data using decladosphere, sevosphere, ribavirin, showing that indeed you can imp expect that patients will get a decrease in their MEL score. In fact, the majority of patients actually do get improvements in MEL score with relatively short courses of treatment. And that's shown here. Not everybody gets an improvement, so the red bars indicate the patients that actually had an increase in their MEL score in the context of treatment. But there is a suggestion, certainly, that you may see dramatic improvements in MEL score. Look at some of those child C patients. Um, with treatment, and that's really what's kind of pushing us to think about treating our patients on the wait list is this goal that maybe we'll be able to rescue them from the need for transplantation. And further to support that is this data, which 
is using soft ribavirin, which we would not consider to be ideal therapy, but they did treat the patients for 48 weeks, which is a long time to have patients on suppressive therapy. These were child's acerotics, but the point of this study, because they did VHPG measurements, was to show us that you can expect a decrease in portal hypertension, so VHPG. It's a modest decrease, only about one quarter of the patients had a decrease of greater than 20%, but it does tell us that even things which we consider to be relatively fixed, like portal hypertension, may be reversed by, by uh, providing uh, patients with successful um, HCV therapy. So these improvements in MELs, these reductions in VHPG, really are the things that are really leading us to consider treating a greater and greater number of patients that might be on the wait list, and certainly patients that are not transplant eligible that are decompensated. I think there's very little to lose by uh, offering those patients treatment because they may indeed derive these very important clinical benefits. Um, so in considering um, treatment of decompensated patients, there's, again, things you have to consider. There are three treatment options available. As I mentioned, they're all Sovospivir-based. Because they're Sovospivir-based, if your decompensated patient has renal dysfunction, then you have nothing to offer. Uh, but if they, your renal function is intact, then you would really think about things like, really, what's my likelihood of success? Can the patient tolerate ribavirin? And probably the most important in the red box is really, what's their their candidacy from the point of view of liver transplant, what's their anticipated time to transplant, and what are my goals of therapy. Now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about sort of new concerns. Um, and the two that I'm gonna talk about is drug toxicity and viral resistance. Um, and I, I really put up this first to remind us that there are drug interactions that we have to be aware of. Um, and I think new real world data is kind of highlighting how complex it can be to treat patients, particularly um, if they have the common comorbidities, this is an abstract from the ASLD, but it just kind of points to the tables highlighting um, the proportion of patients that are on drugs that have drug interactions. And as you can see, the older the patient, the much more likely that they're going to be on at least one drug that's going to have a drug interaction with one of the DAA combos. Um, so just to be mindful that we, um, most of the drugs that we're using have um, one or more drug interactions, so a careful review of those medications is essential. And it's most essential because I would say to you that we really don't have yet enough real-world data about the potential for toxicities with these drugs. And this is highlighted by actually two very recent kind of notifications of drug toxicities in post-approval uh, time. So on the left is a, a a report that just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine reporting on bradyarrhythmias associated with the use of sovospivir therapy. This is a prospective study from France. They studied 415 patients. They had five cases of severe arrhythmias, so it's a relatively small percentage, 1.3%, but they were severe. All three of them required pacemakers to be placed. Um, they all occurred within days of starting the drugs. They're very well detailed in the report in the New England. And they actually did one patient where they rechallenged the patient and indeed got the bradyarrhythmia with rechallenge. So it seems very, um, very much a, 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 a demonstration of the potential for toxicity. And I think you all are aware that there is a black box warning that came out again post approval that states that we should not be co administering Savasvira with amiodarone because of reports of symptomatic bradycardia and even a fatal cardiac arrest. And I make this really not to sort of highlight, oh, you know, Sovosphere per se. I think this is really a, a message to us about all of the drugs. These are, the direct antiviral drugs are new. They move to the market very quickly. Um, we're going to be using them in much uh, more complex um, and potentially sicker patients than was used in the clinical trials. And so we need to be vigilant as, as treaters um, of the potential for these drugs to give us unexpected toxicities. And then just to kind of show you, again, very new, um, just came out in October. At the end of October, we also got an FDA, or FDA warning us about the potential for liver toxicity with the use of the ombidesvir, paritop, or vivotonavir um, combination in patients with cirrhosis, where they, have, um, they had 26 cases reported to the FDA of patients who presented with hepatic decompensation um, and in some cases need for transplantation. Um, these cases, again, um, most occurred within one to four weeks of starting the drug initiation. 
Most of the cases occurred in patients who had been on medications which potentially were contraindicated with this combo or not recommended, sort of highlighting the complexity of using these drugs as we move into the real world. So my message is really one of be vigilant. Um, we're excited about these new drugs. They really have an amazing safety record, but we need to be vigilant, particularly in the kinds of patients that we're treating where they have advanced liver disease, they may have some renal dysfunction, they may be on a dozen medications. We need to be aware that uh, new unexpected toxicities may be apparent. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the treatment failures. Again, when you have a 90 to 95 percent success rate with most of the treatments, this is an infrequent event. Um, but it happens, and when it happens, it does present a new set of problems. So the good news in terms of viral resistance and hepatitis C is that we do not get integration into the host DNA as we do with hep B, or a, and we don't have any archiving of the resistant associated uh, variants, or the RAVs. So there's no known cellular reservoir um, in contrast to, for example, with HIV or HBV. So while we get resistance, we believe it's going to go away, and indeed we have some data to suggest that. Um, the bad news of the equation is that we're learning, I think, as we move forward with DAA therapy, that pre-existing resistant variants can influence and may influence response to therapy in certain subsets of patients. Um, all classes of the direct antiviral drugs um, are at risk for getting resistant associate variants. And we're learning more and more about the risk. It varies by drug, it varies by duration of therapy, and it may vary with whether you use ribavirin or not. So let me just show you a little bit of data. So this is um, looking at drug resistant uh, variants in patients who receive treatment with ombidesvir, paritopavir, ritonavir, dasabivir. And I want to show this slide because I like to show you all of the resistant variants at once. The nice, nice thing, the, the, the good teaching point about that combination is it had three classes of drugs in it. And it shows here that um, in this study, when they looked at the patients who fail therapy, so those that really are at risk for then um, having resistance, um, in the failures, and this is across their program, you can see that they had resistance evident uh, when they followed these patients in each of the classes of drugs. So the protease inhibitor, uh, the NS3, the NS5A position, and the NS5B position, so representing really resistance to the paritopravir component of the therapy, ombidesvir, and dasabivir. My point being, if they fail therapy, it's very likely they're going to have drug resistance to the drugs that you have been treating them with. So that's the first message. Second is, you can see that the proportion of patients that have these resistant associated variants does vary by the class of drugs, and the one that we see most frequently is the NS5A resistant variants, so that's the second message. And then my third message is about their persistence. So what this graph shows you is the dark blue bars are looking at the patients uh, after following them up for four, 24 weeks, and the light blue bars are follow up at 48 weeks. And you can see that the protease inhibitor, or NS3A, um, NS3-4A resistant variants, that really after 48 weeks, most of those variants have disappeared. And we know that, that the protease inhibitor variants tend to disappear relatively quickly, usually within sort of a period of somewhere between 8 to 10 months. In contrast, the NS5A resistant variants um, do not go away. You can see that they still remain quite... Uh, they're quite prevalent, um, even with 48 weeks of treatment. And we have longer data that says that even when you go two years out after an exposure to an NS5A, you see that most of those patients still retain resistance. So the message is that among the drugs that we're using, the group that we have to be most concerned about are the NS5A resistant variants because they are very frequent and they hang around for a long time. So that is the problem, I think, and, and, and by problem, I mean we just have to be thoughtful about it and recognize that when we expose a patient to an NS5A drug, if they are not successful and they're not cured, then we're probably going to have NS5A resistance as our future problem. Um, there are NS5A uh, RAVs that are generally are cross-resistant across many of the drugs. So if you get it with ombidosphere, you're going to have resistance to, uh, to decladosphere and to lidiposphere, for example. Um, and so let me just show you a little bit about the cross-resistance and the potency of the cross-resistance. So we're learning that, you know, we're all going to get very savvy about the various positions and, and really the potency of the resistance um, with those mutations. You can see that the red, which is like the resistance that's um, 
you know, full change of greater than 1,000 to 10,000. So these are highly resistant, kind of very robust resistant variants. And you can see that the position Y93HN is the one in which basically across the three uh, NS5A resistant uh, NS5A inhibitors that we have available, that if you get resistance to that at that position, it's high level resistance and you have cross resistance across all the drugs. So basically this drug class is lost to you as a therapy. And then you can see there's others that we're sort of learning about. So cross resistance really, the important positions are the Q Q30R, the L31M, and especially the Y93HN. Uh, Certainly when we see our patients who have failed, say, sovosphere lidipsevir, and we evaluate them after treatment, if we see that as the resistant variant that they now have, we know that it's likely to stick around for quite some time, and we're not going to be able to use really any other NS5A inhibitors in a future uh, therapy, or at least that would be suboptimal. So just a little bit of data about like what actually happens when you have resistance and then you retreat someone. So um, this is lidiposphere sovosphere retreatment of patients who had failed soft lidiposphere before. So what they took is patients that had been treated with soft lidiposphere for eight or 12 weeks, and then they retreated them, but now they treated them for longer. So usually longer works when we're trying to improve our SVR rates. So on the left, you can see um, in patients that had no resistant variants, 100% of them were successful when they were retreated with that combo. But if they had the resistant variants, their success with retreatment even longer was only 60%. And then shown on the far right are, again, the kind of resistant variants that they housed or that they had. And again, you can see that Y93HN, the success in patients who had that resistant variant was only 33%. So the message here is that um, if you have resistant variants, your success with retreatment with the same combo is going to be poor, and especially if you have resistant variants that are highly, uh, highly resistant, lead to you know thousandfold change in sensitivity. Um, and so actually, it's not recommended that you should do this. And, and in fact, you shouldn't do it because you're just going to create um, kind of compensatory mutations that may actually lead to greater problems. So. What is the strategy in terms of how to, to treat these patients? Well, the, 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 the guidelines are suggesting to us that there are some options, but they're fairly limited at this time. So I'll, I'll show you those at the end. My last um, kind of data slide that I want to show you before concluding is really, do baseline base resistant variants make a difference? In general, the answer is no. So when we start treatment on a patient, we don't test them to see if they have resistance at baseline. We may choose to treat, if we are going to retreat them after they've been exposed to DAAs, we would potentially uh, look for what resistant variants they have. But at baseline, we don't do it. We just decide on the best treatment and we treat. But there's a little bit of data that suggests that there may be subgroups of patients where knowing whether they have baseline resistant um, variants would be important. And this is particularly in cirrhotic. So this is a study looking at cirrhotic patients What's shown here um, on the, let's just look at the bars on the right. Um, it's looking at different kinds of combinations of treatment, all of them with sevosphere, lidiposphere for varying treatments, durations with or without ribavirin. And what you can see is the patients that don't have RABs or the resistant variants, they're the dark purple, their uh, success is uh, higher in terms of SVR than those that have baseline RABs. But in the groups that received ribavirin as part of their cocktail, so that's um, the second set of bars and the fourth set of bars, um, there's very little difference between those with and without RABs. Where it seems to make potentially some difference is in the groups that didn't get ribavirin. For example, in the group that got sevosphere and lidiposphere for 24 weeks, those with RABs had an 85% success. Those, um, sorry, without RABs, had 100% um, success. Um, so there's a suggestion here that um, baseline RABs may make a difference in the cirrhotics. This is the only group of patients in which it's been shown to be potentially influential. And there's a suggestion, at least to me, that ribavirin may be useful in those patients to improve their response rates if they do indeed have baseline RABs. So the take-home messages about resistant associated variants or RABs, you're going to hear about them. Um, a lot, I suspect, going forward. Uh, failure of antiviral therapy will 
be frequently associated with RAVs. Um, uh, NS5A in particular, I think, are the ones that we're most concerned about, but you get, get them with NS3 and to the NS5B region. Um, they do disappear over time, uh, but again, as I highlighted, the NS5A seem to be the most persistent. And ribavirin may have a unique role in patients with RAVs. I think we need more studies to really illuminate that further. So um, how do you approach your patient? And now I'm going to focus on your cirrhotic patient where you really feel like you might have to retreat them after they failed a DAA therapy. If they were exposed to a NS5A inhibitor as part of their treatment and they failed, I think your options are, first of all, you have to test them after they have been treated and you're getting ready to retreat them to find out do they have RAVs or not. So not 100% of patients get RAVs. The shorter the treatment course, the less likely it is that they'll have them. So shown on the left, you'll see the far bar says if they don't have any, any NS5A RAVs, then you can really treat them as you would any other patient. You could retreat them with soft ladiposphere. You could use soft eclatosphere. Basically, there's no limitations. The tricky group is the group that you test them and they do have the NS5A RAVs present and if you have a patient, for example, who's genotype 1, then your options could be that you could use sevospivir with semiprevir because you don't want to use an NS5A inhibitor uh, with ribavirin. So those are, and the recommendation in the guidelines is that this should be your cocktail for 24 weeks. Keep in mind that semiprevir is a protease inhibitor, so you can only choose to use this combo if the patient has compensated cirrhosis. I think for many, um, they might choose to await new treatment options. And then the far box on the, in the diagram shows somebody that has NS5A RAVs but also has NS3 RAVs. That happens if they've been previously exposed to a PI. And at the present time, if you have such a patient, there is nothing to offer that patient. And, and it's a rare patient, but it does occur. And my point in kind of showing that box is to say, this is really the, the things that we're going to be most concerned about, I think, going forward, is that we may have patients in which they have multiple uh, resistant associated variants and will have more limited treatment options available. But I'm not hopeless at all about that, to be honest, mostly because I know that there'll be new treatments coming. Um, so um, I, my final slide, and this is my final slide, um, is that you may choose not to treat patients. So I, it's kind of hard, actually, because when you have a patient come into the office, everybody wants to be treated now. They know about the new treatments. They've seen the commercials on TV. They want to be treated. And, and you might ask yourself, well, why would you not, not treat somebody? And I, I just wanted to lay out a few reasons why you might have the conversation with the patient about why it might be worth waiting. And the first is that I, I think better things are still coming. Believe it or not, um, there's going to be you know, triple therapies. They're going to be shorter courses. We'll have less resistance, I think, going forward. And especially in these more difficult to, cre to cure groups that I just alluded to. Um, and I think sort of minimizing resistance is going to become a bigger theme going forward. And the other thing I think that's reason to have patients wait, and, and we do this frequently in the clinic, is it's just like wait three more months or six more months, is because we're getting smarter as we do treatment and we're getting more data, more real world data is making it into, the, into, the, into publication and being presented at meetings. And we're learning more about the safety of the drugs, how to use them to the best of their ability, um, we are going to learn more about how to retreat these DAA failures and patients with resistance. Um, so I think that we have to give ourselves time to actually accumulate more real-world data um, that's also going to help inform practice and actually make us better treaters when we do treat. So, for example, I saw a patient this week with genotype 3, and I, I said to him, you, know, you should just come back in three months. After the, the liver meeting, and we, there's more data coming out that I know of, wait, because I'll be smarter the next time you see me, and I'll be able to actually make a better decision for you about your treatment. So I think there still is a patient population which we should say you should wait, um, because it, it, the horizon really for new drug therapy still looks very, very good, and more importantly, our understanding about how to do treatment well, I think, is expected to improve further. So with that, I'll stop. Thanks. really terrific. Uh, thank you, Nora. Questions? Before we go... <laughs> the wine is waiting. <laughs> How easy is it? I mean, easy is it to test for the rats? Is it available? Well, it's easy to test for rats. Oh, so, I'm sorry. 
let me, let me come back. The, the question is how easy is it to test for RAS? Um, there are tests, that, there are, it's easy to test for RAS for genotype one. Unfortunately, there, at the moment, we don't have the ability to test for RAS for genotype three or other genotypes, but that's probably gonna come soon. Um, so, uh, there, you know, Monogram does it here in the Bay Area, so does Quest. So you can, you can send it out. It's a send out test, but it, it definitely is, I think, an important step if you're considering retreating somebody who's failed treatment. Various statins have a different propensity for drug interactions. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's any early evidence as to which ones might best be avoided on patients that are getting this therapies. Well, I think the, the, I guess the question is about which of the statins is sort of the best one to go with. So in general, it, it, it depends on kind of which of your treatments you're using as to how much of an interaction there is, but certainly with the protease inhibitors, that's an important drug-drug interaction. Um, so usually we, you can do dose reduction, and pravastatin is usually the one that we sort of recommend. But if it's a short course, sometimes we just stop it for 12 weeks. That's sometimes sort of simpler. And then just have them resume it once they're finished. So that's another strategy that we sometimes use. Lynn taught this week show, and uh, Francis has suggested we have a uh, cup C taught every year. But I have two questions. One is on I have two questions. One is on viral wiring. We've been using it so many years, we still don't quite really know how it works. My question for you is, you know, based on all the data you discussed, you know, how are you going to use viral wiring that will work? Let's say for the F3 patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you going to subject them to you? a very user and friendly drug for that maybe <coughs> percentage, advantage. So question number one, question number two is on RAP. Uh, in the Bay Area, we start seeing patients getting the knockoff uh, sulfoplavir, diclectavir, and the disbelief from India, from, uh, from Bangladesh, because they only cost $2,000 for 12 weeks, which is, you know, $84,000 here. So how do you see that movement going to a fact, you know, the RAP we're going to see in the next three, three years. So your first question is about ribavirin, and I think, I think ribavirin will ultimately be replaced by another DAA. So we're already seeing at the meeting coming up that they're going to, you know, they're putting another drug with um, sevosphere, lidiposphere, and a third drug, like a third class, like another. And so I think with time, ribavirin is going to re be replaced by another drug class. But at the moment, with what we have, um, my team will tell you I'm a big ribavirin fan, actually. Um, and, I, and I think in cirrhotic patients, I think that's one group where I, I do like to use ribavirin. Um, Post-transplant, we like to use ribavirin because all the studies were done with ribavirin. So more advanced liver disease, transplant populations, I try to use ribavirin. Recognizing that you don't have to go with the, like the high doses we used to use with PEG interferon ribavirin, that most of the time we start off with doses of maybe 600 uh, milligrams and then sort of titrate it to their hemoglobin levels and symptoms. So we're a lot more generous about how we do dose reductions. My idea is that they just need some ribavirin on board. I don't think we have to push the doses, especially for genotype 1 patients, for example, when they're on another, um, you know, two other drug classes already. The second question was really about access, really. Yeah. F3? I don't routinely. Um, so the question is, do I use it in F3? So I might, it, you know, there's always a, it, there's a little judgment goes into it. If they were treatment experienced, if they're more like F3, F4, I would lean towards using ribavirin. If I think I can use it safely, I try to include it in a group that I sort of view as being a little bit more difficult to treat. And then your last question I, was about really access, that there's this huge sort of difference. So, so we're going to have patients that are going to go, going to go elsewhere, that, that have the resources to go elsewhere to get their drugs and potentially be treated that way. I think over time the, the issue of the cost will be less. <laughs> and and I, I mean that because I think there'll be more competition within the market itself, and I think also we're going to move towards shorter treatments and kind of be more savvy about you know, being cost effective. But there's just going to be a huge differential between U.S. and India. It's just, that's not going to go away. That's going to exist. So, but I think what we want to work at here in the U.S. is how can we do it cost effectively? How can we work within this system to make it available to more patients? And hopefully new drugs in the market will help to drive down the price. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like this and nobody knows how to get into this video. So how do you, how do you see that? Well, I don't have any, so the question is really about um, um, countries in which the drugs are being made and we're not clear kind of about the quality. Um, and I don't have an answer for that. I, I think it's, we'll sort of learn as we go forward. Um, but my understanding actually in terms of India, I, I mean, at least at the moment, is that actually the, the sort of, the Gilead, for example, if we're talking about Savosphere, Lodiposphere, that Gilead is sort of licensing them to, to make it. So, oh yes, yeah, so that's true. In India, it's true, they don't have that yet. But hopefully they'll have that in the future. But the idea being that there's sort of an arrangement with the company that's making the drug. So although it's sort of like there is some, over, hopefully some oversight there. But I, I don't have any inside information about kind of exactly how that plays out. <clears throat> Last question. Last question. Oh, sorry. Uh, Varun. Uh, Varun, you're not allowed to ask a question. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just curious about RAMs, and particularly the NS5A RAMs, going into transplant. Mm -hmm. you know, does that affect the persistence of those RAMs? So it's a great question. Uh, so the question is, if somebody you know, goes into transplant with resistant associated variants, what sort of is the consequence of that post-transplant, and might it be worse, conceivably? And I don't know the answer. We will look. That is something of interest. Um, but I've always been concerned that if you're maximally suppressed, which happens sort of in that early transplant period, and you've got a, a population of resistant variants, whether that really might sort of seal your fate in terms of them really getting well established and really being the population that will persist for much, much longer. But, but I don't know. We don't have any data yet. Again, it's not archived. You know, it's not integrated. So over time, it should... Um, it should, they should disappear. And at the moment, we don't have any data that says that the natural history of those infections is different, meaning that a patient who's got wild type versus, um, you know, a population of resistant variants has a, like a more severe recurrence, for example. We don't have any data like that, although I would be honest with, in saying that I think the numbers so far are so small that we probably just don't know. But it's, a, it's something we should be attentive to.